Uh, welcome to Plaza 2016. Um, and this is the first seminar of the day. Uh, we are doing five seminars uh, during the, the whole um, two days. So please uh, do come along to any of those that really interest you. Um, just a few thanks before we start. Um, as always, thanks to Function One for their delightful PA and monitors, very kind of them. Uh, Roland for their equally delightful M5000 at the back there. If you don't know the desk, feel free to um, go and press a few buttons if uh, Jose will let you. <laughs> um, Sennheiser for the microphones and headsets and uh, DPA who have lent us a bunch of fantastic microphones as well. And uh, yeah, I'll hand over to John Burt now, who's going to talk about stepping up into a career. Thank you. Thanks, Darren. Um, yeah, this each, every year or so, Darren phones me up and says, um, yeah, do you fancy talking? And she usually does it like a couple of weeks before I'm actually due to talk. And then about a day later, she says, right, so do you know exactly what you're going to talk about then? Have you planned it all out? And can you send me a little three-line thing about what you're going to talk about? And obviously, I've got no idea what I'm going to talk about. So I kind of went, stepping up, stepping up. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about stepping up, the kind of transition between the stage where I think some of you are, of being a younger engineer, probably doing this as a hobby, part-time, and to make that transition to actually making it into a full-time job, which is quite a big step. It's one that I made uh, many years ago. I kind of started off like... Um, <clears throat> Like most people, at about sort of 15, 16, starting being, started dabbling, started getting a tiny bit interested in sound, playing in bands, being interested in that, and uh, getting more involved, starting off and doing a few club shows, working in a local pub, doing a little sound system there, buying my own PA, one of the least wise things I did. Someone's just said out there, so if you want to, if you want to make a small amount of money uh, owning a P PA, start with a big amount of money because there's not much money in it. But uh, I became self-employed. I actually went freelance. I'd already been doing sound for about five or six years before I actually took the plunge and went freelance. And I've been freelance now for 30 years, which I know you're looking at me thinking, there's no way you can be that old, John. But yeah, I've been freelance for quite a long time. And to make the decision to go freelance is a, or to, to seek employment in this industry is quite a hard thing to do. Um, I won't beat about the bush. It is difficult to get work. Um, but hopefully I'm going to try and talk about some of the ways you can approach getting work, uh, not just in the way of actually trying to go out and get work, but in the way you ch uh, your attitude towards and the way you kind of step up to being a professional sound engineer. Um, I started off, that's when I, you know, when you get to talk about, I'm not a professional speaker, so I've got pages and pages and pages of notes here that I made about the many subjects that I could cover and talk about here, but I've only got a certain amount of time, really. Um, the first thing you need to do is think about your suitability as an engineer and the things that interest you and excite you. Um, and it's very much to do with personality. There's kind of different things you can go into as a sound engineer. You can go into um, the kind of standard jobs are work in a club, work in a club, or a pub on a regular basis. And this is the kind of thing you can start, most of us, this is where most of us started. I started off in small pubs, doing the sound on a Friday or Saturday night, uh, and then I progressed to working with a PA company, and then I became a freelance engineer. Uh, you don't have to be a freelance engineer. You know, there's lots of work, well, there's not lots of work, there is work in clubs and theatres. And for some people, it's really suitable um, because they don't want to go away. As a freelance engineer like me, I spend probably seven months of the year on the road, uh, which means that I don't have much of a social life at home, and my wife's always complaining to me, uh, and the kids act like I'm a stranger, but it's, it's a difficult thing to do. Touring is quite hard work, because you, you are away a lot of the time, and it doesn't suit some people. Uh, and you have to be able to get on with people. It's very much like a submarine uh, lifestyle as well. You're stuck with the same group of people for quite a long time. Uh, it doesn't suit some people. Other people find it exciting, interesting. I love it. Um, I've obviously I've been freelance a long time. I still love my job. Uh, I say this quite often. I actually, you know, I'm one of the few people who look forward to work every day. Uh, and there's not many jobs. If anyone's had a job, they know how unlikely that is. Um, but turning this. For most of you, I think most of the people in this room, uh, you're either 
start, you're looking for, presumably, for a job in the industry, or you're already working as a hobby, and it's making that transition to a full-time job, and how you go about that. And it's about um, finding the right kind of attitude to, do, to, to go out and make that transition. Um, the job that we've got uh, is kind of characterised by two main things, really. What we do is sound reinforcement. Um, we're sound reinforcement engineers. And there's a great term that was developed in the 60s called a balance engineer. And what we're doing is balancing the sound. And it's very important to keep this in mind of what your actual purpose is. And that's when you're working is to, to reinforce the sound that's coming off the stage. Uh, and keep that in mind at all time. And use your skills as an engineer to balance the sound coming off the stage. Skills are the one thing that you have to keep learning. If I look back at myself when I was 17, 18, uh, I knew nothing. At 20, I knew nothing. A couple of years ago, I look back at myself a couple of years ago, and I still knew virtually nothing. You've always got to keep learning, and you've got to keep investing in the business that is your your business, which is yourself as an engineer. You've got to start, keep going on courses. I try and go on a course every year. I try and learn something new every year. Uh, I try and pick a topic that I don't know much about because there's so much to learn. And if you keep going back, uh, <clears throat> I would recommend any of you who, who do want to step up to being a full-time engineer to look out and sign up for any course you can go on and to concentrate on one aspect. Um, <clears throat> whether it's something like going along and doing a, a, a line array training course. Um, it might not be something that you specifically need, but it's something to, to gain that knowledge will give you a greater understanding. So I try and sign up for as many courses as possible and do at least one proper course a year or one selection of things, uh, one aspect. Um, the other thing is you've got to try and keep it as broad as knowledge as possible. So you've got to try and look at all the different things. It's incredibly difficult as a sound engineer to make a living. I'm working at what can be considered the high end of the business. I still find it really difficult each year to make enough money. Most people I know who are sound engineers have got several strings to their bow. Uh, I'm predominantly known as a front of house engineer. Uh, I've done front of house predominantly for the last five or six years. But I also quite happily go out and do monitors. Uh, I'll go out and be a monitor engineer, and I'll quite happily go out and do system work, where I just go out, not actually mixing a band, but I'll go out and help set up the system. Uh, and I'll do many other things as well. I, I write, a lot of people I know uh, have done their electrician's course and things like that, so you've got something to fall back on. Because one of the main troubles about uh, this industry is that uh, it's, to a certain extent, it's seasonal. In the old days, when I started, um, You'd never do anything, you'd basically follow the, the school terms and that you'd do touring around the colleges and universities and then it comes to the summer and we did nothing. Nothing would happen in the summer. That's all changed now. Most of my work comes during the summer. All I do these days is festivals. There's so many festivals and so little touring. The year before last I did five days touring and the rest of the year was spent doing festivals. Uh, so I work every weekend from about May till September, and then it goes a bit quiet, and then by uh, sort of end of September, it's trying to get as many much work in before you hit the kind of point at Christmas where everything stops, and that can stop until March. Uh, I didn't start touring again until March this year, so that's two, I actually had three months with no gigs whatsoever. Uh, and if this is happening to me, it's going to happen to a lot of you. And it's happening, uh, it happens in clubs as well. If you're working in a, as a club engineer, you'll find that uh, that tends to follow the terms more because it follows the students coming in and out of the clubs. And then in the summer, you'll go really dead and you'll be trying to find festival work. Uh, and then you've got the same thing, January. Nobody wants to do anything in January. So finding other things to do is an important thing to try and uh, to have some, a second set of skills so you've actually got something to do. Um, for me, I also work in the studio. Uh, and I think it's very important to uh, try and get as many skill sets as possible so you can keep working. Because it's really hard to support yourself just as a freelance engineer. Uh, it's also incredibly good for you to do studio work 
and live work. Because it's essentially the same, it's, you know, you're still listening to things. Um, but it's a, it's, a good, it's a good thing to understand and sit in a room with musicians working on something in a very intimate way. Because one of the troubles of being a live sound engineer is that you've got this great divide between you and the artist. Me as the artist, I've got an engineer over there who's a good distance from me, but I've still got to build up a relationship with them. And one of the important things about being a, a professional engineer is building up relationships with artists. Because at the end of the day, a lot of the time, you're, they're going to be your clients. Uh, as an engineer, your clients tend to be just two lots of sets of people. One is the artist you're going to work with. Most of my work as a freelance engineer is working for a particular artist. Uh, so I'll start a tour. I'll, I'm currently employed by The Prodigy, who I've worked with for quite a few years, and I work for them directly. They are my client. But in previous years, I've worked for PA companies where they are my clients, so working for the PA company. But it's very important to uh, build up relationships and know what your relationship is with the client. Working with musicians... It's a question of winning their trust and having the right attitude. And to be honest, having the right attitude underpins everything about professionalism and about how you're going to succeed. Uh, if you ask any engineer, it's like, you know, what do you need to be a good engineer? You need the basic set of skills, and then you need the right attitude. And the right attitude, uh, I was talking to one of the other engineers, Justin, who so said, so what's the most important thing? He said, well, turn up on time. Turn off on time helps, uh, and have, walking in with a good attitude and meeting people with a good attitude and a good work ethic. A good work ethic is incredibly important because you're doing something... Uh, the thing with music is the show must go on, so you have to be ready to do everything and to do it when it's needed. Um, working with musicians, uh, you have to go in with the attitude that you are the professional who's going to do a job for them. Um, this sounds like an obvious thing, but one of the constant things that I notice about younger engineers and uh, less experienced engineers is their complete fear of talking to anyone. The first thing you do when you meet a new band or you're working with a band, even if you're a club engineer, if you're the house engineer at a club or if you're working with a band, the first thing you've got to do is actually go up to them and introduce yourself. And the number of times I fail to see this happen is amazing, really. Uh, and it just makes life automatically more difficult. You've actually got to have the courage. And this is something that does, you do need to work on. It's quite hard uh, for an engineer and for anyone. It's hard to go out and meet new people straight away. Um, but you have to get the courage and kind of go, hi, my name's John. I'm going to be your sound engineer today. Find out their names. I always write down names because I've got a terrible memory. Write down the names and what they do. Uh, and go and talk to them and ask them if there's anything they need. Ask them what they want their sound to be like. Um, because you're working for their behalf. And it's the same if you're working for a PA company as well. You've still got to go over and find out what your client needs and introduce yourself to your client. Uh, the other thing is you still need to look presentable as well, which is another thing that amazes me. The number of people I turn up and they turn up in nice, colourful shirts. Uh, black. Roadies wear black. It's, you know, I, I'm really sorry, but we walk about on stage and we're not supposed to be seen. So I always wear a black short sleeve shirt to work and dark trousers. And I always try and look presentable. And the great thing about this is when I started realising that if you wear quite a smart black shirt and dark trousers, people stop asking you to move boxes about as well. And they start treating you like you're slightly better than them, which is quite good. And I always wear a short sleeve shirt because if you've ever mixed a desk with a wrong, long sleeve shirt and caught the fader on your cuff, you'll start wearing short sleeve shirts. Um, and just going in, looking like you're there to work, because it is a job, and it's incredibly important to look like you're actually supposed to be there working. As an engineer, one of the most common faults I see um, from young engineers is... The kind of it's the the kind of super glued to the desk thing, really. Um, a lot of young engineers I know will just get to the desk and they'll stand there and they'll just mix the show, and they'll do anything you tell them, and you say, "Yeah, it's all great." Um, the one thing I have learned is that club gigs, in fact, most gigs. I mean, I work from small clubs up to giant arena stadiums. 
The one thing I have learned is that the PA system isn't always working properly. In fact, it's the one thing you do notice is that wherever you go around the world, incompetence surrounds us. Um, people don't set up systems very well. Uh, it's a sad thing, especially in America. America is the home of the bad club PA system. If you think clubs in the UK have got rubbish sound systems, go to the United States of America, because there's some fantastically bad systems there. Um, I, the worst one I had was uh, I went to a, a club in, I think it was, a, it was in Ohio, and they had uh, some sort of 2 15s with a horn in a kind of goalpost arrangement. So there are a cab there, a cab going this way across the top of the stage, then another one, and then another one going down the side. And it all sounded absolutely dreadful. And the bloke's going, oh, it's the room. And you're going, well, it's just a bar. You know, it's like a normal square room. And the guy's going, oh, it's always been like this. And we actually went round, and I actually kind of listened to it. I actually got a step ladder so I could listen to the speakers. And after a bit of investigation, found out that of the two 15s in each cabinet, every single fifth, half of the 15s were wired out of phase with the other half. So it was just like the worst sound. Uh, and the important thing about that is, is because I actually got a stepladder and stood up there and listened to the speakers myself, because I don't trust anyone, because uh, I'm a professional engineer. And it's not that I don't think other people are professional, but I don't take, my, take their word for it. I actually go and... Because at the end of the day, they're not, I, the band or the client are going to go, John, why was it sounding so rubbish? And you go, well, the house bloke said it always sounds like this. It's not really good enough. So it's up to you to go in and listen, which doesn't mean you charge in there and go, I know your PA is going to be rubbish, so I'm going to fix it straight away. You just go in there and you listen. Because the great thing about us is we all have some really good, we all have good ears. We do this because we like listening to things. I think most people in this room, if you want to be a sound engineer, you've got to enjoy listening to things. Does everyone enjoy listening to things? And like listening to noise and exploring sound. Uh, so the first thing you should do when to, you go into a club is, well, the first thing you should do is introduce yourself. Go in, and if there's a house engineer, go in and say hello. Say, hi, my name's John, I'm your sound engineer for tonight. I'm with the band. Uh, what's your name? I'll do the usual, and uh, anyone fancy a cup of tea, which tends to revolve, my life revolves around making tea for people. It's the great leveller. Um, and s trying and s get, first of all, listening to the PA system and finding out if it's all working properly. To do this, I always use a mono signal. It's really important to use a mono signal, which I then put down a channel on the desk, and then I pan it from one side to the other. If both sound, sides sound the same, you're onto a good start, really. If they sound different, you know there's something wrong, because it's the same signal going from one side to the other. Uh, if it still sounds OK, um, I'll then walk about the room. And I'll go and listen, because rooms all sound different, and PA systems sound different. And it's important to know that where you're mixing from sounds similar to the rest of the room. Uh, and it's amazing the number of times it doesn't. Because a lot of clubs and theatres and things, they put the desk where it's convenient for ticket sales, really. Uh, in most small clubs, it's in some far corner right at the very back, next to the bar, usually, uh, because it's not going to get in the way of the dance floor. Um, and it's usually... The one thing we know about corners is that bass likes to hide around in corners. You know, it likes to hang out there. Bass is like a mugger. It likes little shadowy, dark areas, and it will sit there accumulating quite happily. So you've got to get out from behind the desk, stick a track on that you know, and go out and listen and walk around the room. The number of engineers I see do this as a percentage is probably less than 10%. And it tends to be all the better engineers. Because they actually get out and they don't trust... It's not that they don't trust anyone, but they want to know for themselves that what they think is right is right. And it involves walking around the room while you listen to a track and seeing what, what it actually sounds like. Um, and if you have got a problem... The best thing to do then is to put on, put some pink noise through the PA and then just uh, show whoever's the house engineer or find out where the problem is. The great thing about pink noise as a tool 
is that you can't really argue with it. And also, it doesn't go into a really quiet middle eight, halfway while we are trying to listen to the subs. So you can just go and have a listen. And don't listen to it loud. You can just listen to it quietly and walk, walk through the room. I was trying to explain... I did a, a, a visit to a club in Sheffield last night where we spent most of the day fixing the PA. Uh, and then the club owner came, and I was trying to explain... Um, what was wrong with their PA system. And it's really difficult because people just don't believe you. You kind of go, well, it's, you know, if, you, you know, if you're standing at the bar over there, you, just, you can't really hear it because you haven't got enough speakers to cover. And they're going, well, we've got all those big speakers up there. And you kind of go, yeah, I know, but that's... And then you start saying, yes, but with the 60-degree horn, the 40-degree, you're not really getting the dispersion. You could just see her just glaze over completely. And so what I did was just put some pink noise quite quietly... And I just got her to follow me around. I said, right, what can you hear now? And she's going, well, I can hear that annoying sound. And I'm going, yeah, what can you hear now? And she's going, well, I can hear less of the annoying sound, and it's all really dull. And I said, well, that's because where we're standing, you can't really hear the horns. And if you can't hear the horns, it's going to sound dull. And when the singer sings, it means that what you're going to hear here is this. I can't really hear anything. Uh, so pink noise is a great thing to demonstrate and it's a good thing to demonstrate to yourself and to anyone else where you're trying to explain a problem because it is a flat sound, you know, it's something that's really easy. And it is the greatest tool. It's also one of your greatest enemies because if you use pink noise all the time, and I know this, uh, I know quite a few engineers who spend a lot of time playing pink noise through the PA, which is great apart from all the people you're working with, all of whom hate you intensely. Because listening to pink noise really loud for long amounts of time is really, really boring. And it's kind of inconsiderate uh, for anyone you happen to work with. I've got a kind of um, two-minute rule, really, uh, throughout the day. Or maybe five minutes on a big gig. I won't allow any more than five minutes of pink noise. Because you can just do it quickly. People just leave it running for an hour and spectrum analyse the room endlessly and wonder about it. It just gets really boring for everyone else. And you have to work as part of a team. Um, which I'll come to in a bit. But going out and checking the systems working is one of the best ways of improving yourself as an engineer because you know what's happening then. And you need to be getting out. When you're doing the sound check, you need to be getting out from behind the desk and uh, walking about the room and checking it sounds the same out there for the audience as it does for where you're back there. And a lot of the time, it doesn't. And this is where you really do have to step up as an engineer because you then have to start mixing the show not for yourself but for the audience because they're the people that matter. You know, mixing a show for yourself uh, you've got to do for a certain extent but sometimes you have to mix a show really bass heavy because you're stuck in the dark corner at the back and all the audience, the moment you come out you know, you can get it sounding fantastic back there but then you come out and you're going where's the bass guitar, where's the bass drum? It's all gone. It's the thinnest thing in the world. And then you have to go back to the desk and mix it so that it sounds better out there and keep going back and referencing what it sounds like for the audience because they matter more than you. Um, I'll quite often... I'll sacrifice the sound at the mixing desk to make it sound better for the rest of the arena or for the club because it's the audience that matters. And what's the most single important thing when we mix? What's the thing we should care about the most? What's the only really important thing in a gig? Being able to hear the words. It's the only criticism you'll get as an engineer. And this is something I keep drumming into everyone, I'm, you know, everyone I teach and everyone I meet. The thing that's going to get you sacked, or the thing that's going to get you work, is a nice vocal sound. Because the one criticism you will get as an engineer, and this will keep coming back to haunt you, is people will come out and say... Yeah, it sounded pretty good, but I couldn't hear the words, which is damning condemnation in my book. And the one criticism you will get, well, one praise you will get is when people come out and go, that was really good, that sound. I could hear all the words. And this is a 90% of the population are only really interested. Very rarely does someone come out and go, well, I couldn't really hear the words, but I tell you what, that bass guitar was fantastic. Or oh, did you hear that floor, Tom? It just doesn't happen, you know. It's being able to hear the words is important. Uh, and just remembering, you know, this is what most people come to gigs to hear. Is they want to sing along with the words. And getting a good vocal sound is what separates uh, a lot of engineers 
younger engineers from older engineers, or good engineers from bad engineers, to be honest. Um, I do a lot of festivals, and I think as engineers, if you're out there gigging and working, what you will find is that you'll do an increasingly large number of festivals. Um, and festivals are great because you get approximately no time whatsoever to sound check, and you just have to mix by the seat of your pants. Uh, and the number of times I stand behind, because I often, because I'm often at festivals standing, waiting to do it for my turn, and I'll see engineers lower down in the bill. Uh, and the ones that separate the good ones from the bad ones are the ones where the band walk on and the engineer is working on the one thing that's important. He's got the vocal up and he's bringing everything else up to meet that. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <coughs> And what you see is you see an engineer who's working on that sound and the audience are all focusing on the vocalist. They don't really notice the fact that the, the, the drums aren't really loud enough yet because the singer's on, the singer's talking to the audience, he's introducing the band, they start playing and you can hear the words. And they're concentrating on that. And my main thing is I always concentrate on the vocals first and then you bring everything else up to meet it. Uh, and this tends to be a, a fault of a lot of engineers. You'll see them struggling around, trying to working on the hi hat. You can't hear the words, but the hi hat's sounding nice and crispy. Uh, and this is kind of these. You've got to really work on the important things, um, which tends to be strange enough. Vocals, then bass drum. People tend to miss the bass drum first. Uh, bass drum and a bit of snare, and then you can build everything else up. Guitars are the last thing you need to worry about, really. Uh, keyboards tend to be quite a good thing to work on next. And to be honest, this is how I approach mixing in general. I tend to work from the vocals down. Uh, I'm not a great proponent of the endlessly listening to the bass drum. Um, I tend to like to get drummers to play time when I'm sound checking. So it gives me a better idea of what the whole drum kit sounds like. Uh, because the thing about it is if you, if you listen to a drummer play, um, most drummers I know have got fairly short attention spans and you get them to do the bass drum. You kind of go, bass drum, and they'll do this for ages. And, you kind of, and then they'll lose interest, and they'll notice something like something shiny will happen over there. And, uh, and they'll go. And you go, bass drum. Go. And it just gets really boring for you, because they play it different. And you'll also find they'll, let, they'll only play the bass drum that hard when you ask them to. And then if they start playing time, all of a sudden the bass drum's a lot quieter and sounds completely different but you've just wasted half an hour doing the bass drum. So I tend to get drummers to play a bit of kick, snare, and hi-hat, because uh, it's a great way of... Drummers will do this for days. It's like a little clockwork bunny. You could say, can you play some time? And they'll just sit... But you have to say, can you play some time? But don't do any toms just yet. Otherwise, they just launch into an endless drum solo. Uh, but they'll just quite happily play away for, and do that. And it gives you a much better idea of what it's going to sound like overall. And then I'll get the bass player to join in usually. And then I'll do the guitars and stuff afterwards. <clears throat> but the important thing is to work on a balance and getting that balance and work on the idea of sound reinforcement. What we're doing is we're adding to what's on stage. The, the thing that freaks out studio engineers uh, when they choose to do live work tends to be the fact that when you pull all the faders down, I quite often see, I've seen some very good studio engineers mix some very bad shows because they keep pulling all the faders down and nothing disappears. The guitar's still just as loud as when they were mixing it. And it's like, well, how do I get the guitar quieter? He said, well, you then have to venture onto the stage and have a conversation with the guitarist, which is probably the hardest thing. Uh, this is the one thing I will not be able to solve in this talk, because I don't think, I haven't found the answer to this. How do you get the guitar uh, to the right level on stage that's acceptable for A, the rest of the band, and you as the engineer? And it's still one of the great mysteries, but apparently Justin's going to solve this one with Mr. Guthrie's help later this afternoon. I'll be coming back to check up on this as well. Um, but yeah, having conversations with bands on stage, but to go and have a conversation with a band, you already have to know their names. But luckily, because you're a professional, you've introduced yourself and they know you're the sound engineer and you're dressed quite smartly and you've got a nice black shirt on and you're polite and you were there before they got there because you got there on time and they're going to take, treat you with a certain amount of respect. So you're going to be able to go up to them. <clears throat> and you already talked about their interests. Uh, I've, you know, 
I've always recommend just going and talking to talking to the musicians on stage and showing an interest in what they do, because if they know that you care about what they're doing, they're going to respect your opinion more. Doesn't mean they're necessarily going to pay any attention to it, but at least you've got a starting point. So just going up and uh, conveniently, we've got a guitar cab on stage. <clears throat> Whenever I do guitar, I always go and have a listen to the guitar on stage. Um, which is mainly because uh, we're going to put a microphone down here on a guitar amp and the guitarist is going to listen to it standing here. And as we all know, we don't have ears in our knees. Um, and most of the sound's going to come out down there and they're going to listen to it up here and it's going to sound quite different up here. So I always go down and have a listen on stage and see what it sounds like where the guitarist is standing. And I try and use that as the point to recreate the sound of the PA which is always slightly duller, uh, the sound up here, than it is going to be right in front. But just walking about the stage and showing an interest in what they're doing, you know, showing, saying... And it's, it's, you know, it sounds a bit like, you know, kind of a bit creepy, really, saying, you know, that's nice. But it's not. It's, it's, we've all got an interest in music. We've still got an interest in what we're doing. And showing an interest in, you know, the kind of sounds a keyboard player's using, saying, you know... If you notice, they've got a particular saying, you know, what sound do you use quite a lot? And listening to what they do. And said, oh, have you got any sort of pad sounds? How do you think? And just having conversations with musicians and seeing how it all fits together. Uh, and you can do this really quickly, and you should be able to do this with every band, even if it's a support band, just coming into the club that you're doing. And you should be able to go up to them and have this conversation, because it doesn't take long. You know, you go, well, I'm too busy, you know, we've got 10 bands on tonight, you know, and we only get 15 minutes between each band. But in those 15 minutes where you're getting one band off and the other band on, you're still going to be walking out on stage, plugging microphones in. It still doesn't take you more than a few minutes to just go around and say, hi, I'm John, I'm the sound engineer. <clears throat> if there's anything you need, uh, you know, no, I'm sorry, we haven't got any plug boards, you should have bought your own. Uh, that kind of thing, and just but go and say, you know, introduce yourself and say to them, you know, what you're doing and your role in things, and also say, you know, is there any, the best question is, is there anything you think I should know? Is always a great question. Oh, is there anything uh, you think you want to? Say? Is there anything in the set, set list that you think I should know? Because uh, the number of times they go, oh yeah, it's, uh, oh oh yeah, we forgot to tell you, yeah, on the third song we all play ukuleles. You know, it's kind of good to know before it happens, really. But just having these conversations, it's a question of breaking down barriers and going in and talking to the musicians um, <clears throat> before you hear. I'm kind of talking a lot about sort of um, my kind of experience as a sort of touring engineer. But as a club engineer, you know, it, gets, it is very hard to keep up the enthusiasm week in, week out, doing three or four bands a night. But the important thing is, is that most club engineers... Um, some are happy to stay in clubs. A lot want to go out and freelance. Um, a lot of the engineers I know who work with hugely successful bands started off as club engineers and were nice to bands coming in and treated them special and treated them in a professional way. And when the band, who were third on the, band, on the bill, come into your club and you're really nice to them, and then when they come back again, and they're second on the bill, and then they come back a month later, and they're headlining, it's the first time they're headlining, and they haven't really got an engineer, they'll remember you, and they'll say, oh, we've got some more gigs somewhere else. We haven't got much money, but you fancy coming and mixing us at these other shows? And I know this is how people, I'm uh, pretty sure Dan Green, who did Coldplay, this is how he got the Coldplay gig, because he was the really nice local engineer working in a club, and there's lots of friends I've got who've done this thing. Going in, being really professional, being professional with bands, treating them in a professional way, and winning their uh, respect, really. And then when they want to go out on tour, they're going to remember the nice bloke who treated them well <coughs> and give them the opportunity. And so at the time, um, I'll, come, I'll come across bands, uh, and I'll go, and they'll say, oh, we know you, we know you, because you were doing... Quite often, I'll get work with support bands that I've had on tour because they'll remember me because I always make a point of... <clears throat> there's a great thing of like being horrible to support bands, which I've never understood. Support bands are the headliners of tomorrow. 
why would you piss off people who are going to employ you potentially? So I always make a point of you know trying to trying to help support bands as much as possible, and going and saying hello, not undermining their engineer, but just making sure that everything's all right and looking after younger engineers. Um, <clears throat> One of the criticisms I've got of a lot of younger engineers is that you don't ask questions enough. Most people like me, we are a font of useless information, some of which is useful. Um, come as a, you know, if you're a support band engineer, go and talk to your main engineer and watch what he does. Watch his show. Watch, well, not all the shows, not every night, but you know, stay. There's a reason why the headline engineer is the headline engineer. And there's a reason why you're the support band engineer. It's because he's got better contacts and knows more than you. So what you should do is you should treat this as an education opportunity. And the number of support band engineers I know who never watch my show, never ask me any questions, and kind of go, the best ones are the ones who go, well, he's, he's always louder than I am. I said, yeah, of course I'm louder than you are. I'm doing a really loud band and I'm the headline act. Um, but what you can do is you can talk to me and if you treat me with respect and you show an interest and you show talent and ability, I'll let you be a bit louder. If you kind of ignore me and kind of nonce about in a kind of non-professional way, then I can make your life a lot more hell than you can make mine. <clears throat> and it's all a question of coming in with the right attitude. If you come onto a tour with me and you go, hi, I'm John, I'm the support band engineer. Uh, I'll try not to get in your way uh, and you know, I um, hope we're going to have a really nice time. Do you fancy a cup of tea? That's going to get you a lot further than anything else. Uh, and it's the same with anything, going in with the right attitude. Another thing is I say to people, uh, take contacts. This whole business relies on contacts. <clears throat> there's, no, there's no real, there's a couple of little agencies. I know Darren does uh, some agency stuff. But most of the work for most of us is word of mouth. And what you should be doing, the way to, to move on, is to making an, taking the email and telephone number of everyone you can think of and everyone you meet, writing it down. I always write a little note, you know, like the name of the band they were working for, how well they did, and I take their phone number. Because people like me get people like you jobs. Because quite often I'll get phoned up and they say, oh, can you do this? And I go, no, I can't. I'm already doing that. And they'll say, do you know someone else who can do it? And you go, well, try Fred, Jack, or Jill. <clears throat> and I'll pass on people's phone numbers. And this is how most of the work in this industry goes. Uh, you don't go for job interviews. You do need a CV. And I know Darren will be covering, covering CVs later. Uh, you do need a CV. But the most important thing you've got is your contact list of knowing people. Uh, I remember some students um, because they come up and they take my email address and they take my telephone number. Uh, I, tend to, I tend to give out my email address to anyone. My telephone number is a bit more sacred. Uh, but I'll give out my email address to anyone because I can put an email in the trash. I can ignore it. But quite often people say, oh, John, can I send you my CV? And I will keep their CV because it doesn't hurt, you know. My computer's not going to be filled up with CVs. They're only small. You know, I can keep everyone's CVs, and I can keep it next to their contact detail. And I will remember young engineers, because I quite like having young engineers that I know I can pass gigs on to, that I can trust. Because a lot of the time, people phone up and say, look, um, we've got this band. We know you can't do it, because you're going to be too expensive. But do you know any young, fresh-faced engineer who'll come out and do it for virtually nothing? And I'll go, yeah, well, I had this CV from this lad the other day. I think he's pretty good. He seems to have worked at a few gigs, uh, but he's really keen when I met him. He seemed well organised. He was polite. He seemed to have a really good attitude. And the key word there is attitude. We kind of all presume you've got the ability, uh, and your CV's got to back up your ability, but it's having the right attitude is important. Uh, looking like you want to work. Acting like you want to work. Uh, and this... And most of the work, it's, it's down to having this attitude. And this attitude is something you've kind of got to build up. And it's a certain amount, it's to do with confidence. Uh, and confidence in your own ability, uh, which is something you can't really teach someone. But 
walking in with the right attitude. And part of the thing about attitude is, is that, you know, if someone phones you up, say, are you free tonight? I never say, I never say no first time to anything. I always say yes, possibly, and find out more about it. Because you, uh, you never know what it's going to be like. You never know what the show is. If someone said, look, can you be, if you're young, 20 years ago, so can you be on the other side of town in half an hour? Because uh, my other engineer has got his head down the toilet. He's been there for about an hour, and we don't think he's going to come out. And you go, yeah. And you do, because you've got to get opportunities. And you can never turn down opportunities. You've got to be willing and able to get across town if you possibly can and go and walk into that gig. Because if you do save people like that, and if you do help them out, people do remember. And that's your foot in the door. And getting a foot in the door is so hard because there's loads and loads and loads of people who want to be sound engineers. Um, They think until they actually start doing it and then they realise that the money is actually rubbish. The hours are incredibly long and tedious and you don't always get to work for the people that you want to work with. And then when you do get to work with the people you really, really want to work with because you've liked them since you were kids, you realise they're not actually the people you thought they were. And sometimes they're not quite as nice. But that's very rare. Most people are really nice. Most bands I work with have always been really nice. <clears throat> but you've got to be willing to do anything. And the other thing about being willing to do anything is that you can't kind of decide, do you know what I'm going to be? I'm going to be the number one. It's like if you said to me, like, yes, you're going to be one of the top dance engineers. How would have been going, you're joking. You're like, well, me, dance music. And I've been doing nothing but dance music now for about 10 years. Um, we were having conversations with me, uh, uh, Rampton, who does Chase and Status, and Mark Kennedy, who does uh, Pendulum. And we're kind of going, here we are, combined age of almost 180. And we're the three cutting-edge dance engineers in the country. How sad is that? Come on, kids, step up. Come on. You should be out. You should be stealing my job. Um, but the one thing about it is this, that you never quite know what you're going to enjoy doing. You should always be, sound is sound. I am interested in sound. I'm interested in mixing. I'm interested in all aspects of sound. And genre is less important to me than, uh, than a lot of people probably think. Because you never quite know what you're going to enjoy doing. Uh, and I've said this many times. I, one of the best tours I did was with the band Blue. It's an old boy, you know, the, the boy band Blue. But they were great fun. It was a proper band. We had really good session musicians, so they were a pleasure to deal with. And Lee is still probably the most rock and roll person I've ever had the pleasure of working with and was endlessly amusing. Um, so you never know. And I, when they first came out, they were going, really? What, pop music? Really, me? I'm cutting edge dance, me, mate. And they're going, well, yeah, but it's a, it's a two-week tour of Japan and you get six days off in the middle. And you're going, do you know, that sounds exactly like my kind of tour. <clears throat> so I signed up for that. And I actually had, and then I went up and did a second tour with them, and I, I really enjoyed the time working with them. Because you never quite know what's going to be good fun. You never quite know what's going to be the tour and the type of music you're going to enjoy. Because it, it's one of those things, it's like the more you listen to music, uh, the more you can, it's, you know when you listen to a track on the radio and it just kind of gets ingrained with you, and you stop listening to the overall music and you just get obsessed with the sound of it. And to a certain extent, as an engineer, that's part of your job, really. Your job's not to critique the music. Your job is to make it sound better, to reinforce it and do a good balanced mix for all the audience where you can hear the vocals at every seat in the house. That's your job. Uh, And that can be for the most diverse selection of people. People I've enjoyed working with. I enjoyed, I did Lulu. She was brilliant fun. Really scatty, lovely lady. Completely different from doing The Prodigy. Also, lovely blokes. Uh, completely different, the loudest band I've ever worked with. Completely bonkers, but really good fun. The most musical experience I had was working with the Count Basie Orchestra, which was completely different from anything. I never really realised how great working with <clears throat> 26 old jazzers who have been playing for 50 years could be, because I'd never heard that kind of musicality before. I never heard 25, 26 people playing so bob on in time and pitch perfect. It was just the smoothest thing. They were so, so cool. It was brilliant. And you never know what's going to be good. In some ways, as an engineer, it's better not to be doing your favourite genre of music because then you kind of get 
you start critiquing the music, I think, too much. It's better to do a wide selection thing. Some people, I know people who just do system work. They just build PA systems. They never mix anything. I've got a friend, if you get him on a PA tour, as part of my PA crew, <clears throat> he's passed away now, but he would always be a great person on the crew. And he'd always do his bit, and he'd do it really well. And he was doing the best of this. If you'd say to him, can you just uh, stand behind the desk while the support man's on? Because uh, I, just, I just want to try and get out. And he'd go, oh, no, not doing that. He refused point blank to stand behind a mixing desk. He'd worked as a PA engineer for 20, 30 years, but he wouldn't stand, he hated the responsibility. He hadn't, like, no, no, because someone might ask me something. Someone's going to say something to me about the vocal, and then I'll freak out and I'll have to go home. So he would never stand behind the desk, but he was the most system engineer I'd ever worked with, because he would just go around and listen and set up the system. And there's lots of people that can be a role for you out doing that. I enjoy doing system work, uh, and I think it's really important for engineers <clears throat> not just to be stood behind the desk, but to go out and find out how systems work. Find out about acoustic theory. Find out why speakers work in a certain way. Once you've worked out um, the basic rules of physics and how it affects you, it revolutionises your mixing abilities, really, because you know what you can fight and what you can't, because you can't fight against the rules of physics. You can't make the base of these two speakers sum perfectly all around the room. You know, <clears throat> it's just the way it is. If you've got a left and right sub, you're going to get a power alley. It's just the way it is. There's nothing you can do about it. There's going to be sub there, there's going to be a gap here, more sub here, and a gap there, because you've got two sound sources. <clears throat> and once you begin to know this kind of stuff, uh, mixing becomes a lot easier. Because when you're walking about the room, you're not going, oh, it's less sub here, it's more sub there, why is that? Because you know. And you can just work on a general idea and know how you're going to mix it. Um, and having the knowledge. I don't fly PAs anymore. I don't get involved with motors. Uh, I, don't do, I never do my own noise prediction, but I know how to do it. So that when I have a conversation about how my system's set up, I've been on the training course, I've done the Vert Vertec course, I've done the VDOS course, I've done the DMB course, I've done the Martin Audio course, I've done the Mayer course. And I recommend you all go on at least one or two courses. Because they're all different, everyone's got different... The great thing about uh, standardised knowledge is that they all disagree on it. Uh, and we won't even bring function one into this. But everyone's got a different idea on how speakers are done. But there's, the laws of physics don't change, it's how you approach them. But you've got to go and find out this stuff and go and go on training courses and find out how big systems work because they're your tools of your trade. You know, <clears throat> I imagine if you ask a Formula One driver how the car works, they don't know how everything nuts and bolts work, but they've got a good general overview of how their car works. You know, they know something about the mechanics of it. They don't just know how to drive. They know a lot about the general system as well that they're using. Uh, and it's important for you as engineers to understand, not just stand behind the desk. Find out how microphones work. Find out how different microphones are uh, using different microphones for different things. Because there's no such thing as the right microphone. There's no such thing as the, you know, the perfect speaker. And it's using them and finding out all the different things about a microphone where it's going to work for you and against you where a speaker's going to work for you and against you. <clears throat> and to a certain extent, you've got to find this out for yourself. Um, and just try things. Uh, and the most important thing is to continually listen. Continually use your self-critique to listen to what you're actually doing. Uh, and, you know, I'm a big proponent of walking about with a microphone around a drum kit and listening to see where it sounds best. Or, you know, putting, finding, walking around the snare drum with a microphone and moving it before I decide where it's going to go. And I always go for where it sounds best. The bottom line for me is where it sounds best. Where are you going to put the microphone? Where it sounds best. Not where you think it should be, but just like moving, even moving a, uh, around a guitar amp and trying to find, <clears throat> particularly with 4x12, it's, a lot of time it can be find the speaker that's working. The number of times you put it and you're thinking, Chin, it doesn't sound very good, does it? And you just go over and move the uh, microphone to the other speaker. Oh, that's a lot louder, isn't it? But listening to things 
and using what sounds best to you and then deciding if that sounds best for the whole room <clears throat> and the pros and cons because there's no such thing as the right you know there's no perfect microphone there's no perfect speaker and you've got to find out and and use your judgment to see how much time i've got there <clears throat> use your judgment really you also have to remember where you are as an engineer um, it's very easy, and this is kind of uh, another thing that I could critique a lot of young engineers for, is that you, you develop tunnel vision. You're the sound engineer. I'm just going to do sound. Everything else is unimportant, okay? The most single important thing is the sound. You know, if you go to a gig, what's the most important thing? The sound. The most important thing in the sound is hearing the vocals. And everything else you ignore. Standing next to you at front of house is the lighting bloke. The lighting bloke is only interested in the lights and will quite happily move your speakers out of the way so he can put his lights there. And then you move them back again because that's where the speakers need to be. And then you have a fight and it goes on. And then there's a whole selection of uh, technicians on stage who have got very much the same opinion. <clears throat> the professional goes and talks and works as part of a team and you've got to see the big picture. Uh, and the big picture is the overall show. The most important thing is the overall show for the audience, not for you. And a lot of time, uh, you'll get into situations where potentially you'll get to compromise sound decisions so you can put some burly lights somewhere. And it will happen. And what you've got to do is whether it's important, whether your minor thing you're going to do is going to compromise the whole show. And having uh, a good attitude and having the attitude of professionalism where you see the big picture, see how where your part of it fits in with everything. Um, I will move speakers for so lighting guys can put lights there. Because sometimes uh, you find you always, the automatically default position is no way, no way I'm going to move anything. You know? And a lot of time you're kind of going, well, to be honest, you know, if he really needs to put that there, a light there, if it's really that important, Mr. Lampy, it doesn't matter if I push that a bit further that way. In the great scheme of things, probably pushing that further a foot that way is not going to be that big a deal. If he wants to put a light right in front of it, then I'm going to explain to him what a stupid idea that is and ask him if he can move it. But you've got to see the big picture and you've got to be willing to discuss these things. Uh, and willing to discuss things is kind of does separate a lot sort of amateurs from professionals. And you have got to not get into this tunnel vision thing of just doing what, you, what you've got to do. What you've got to do is really important uh, and you should always work, prioritise your stuff. Uh, and kind of, but you can't work in an isolated way. Uh, Justin, we were talking about this earlier and he said, you know, you've got to kind of sort your shit out and then if someone else asks, you then go and help them. But you've got to know where your territory is and do your job properly before you do anything. But you've got to be very much aware of the big picture and how you fit into everything else. Um, but to kind of progress, it's a question of building yourself as an engineer, really. Looking around and seeing what you've actually... Uh, trying to learn as much gaining as much experience in as many different related fields as possible. Not just saying, like, it's the best thing as a front of house engineer you can do is go and be a monitor engineer for a while. And then you'll realise how hard it is to be a monitor engineer. And then, if you're a monitor engineer, go and do front of house for a while, and you'll realise the problems that a front of house engineer has um, that are different from a monitor engineer. Be a systems engineer. Being a systems engineer for a while and just doing the system is really great because you get to watch different engineers mix and you get to see what they do and you get to see what's important to them. And because you're not mixing, you spend a lot more time listening to the overall thing. So it's seeing it from different perspectives will really help to gain your knowledge. So going out and listening. Going and watching gigs. If you go and see a good gig and it sounds good, go and have a chat with the sound engineer. Say, I really like what you did. What did you do on the vocal that was so good? Because it's not many secrets, you know. I don't know any engineer who goes, "Oh, I can't tell you that. I'd have to kill you." It's like you know, a secret trade secret, mate. It's like it's not. It's a fifty-eight. It's like it's a fifty-eight. But you seem to have got that nice box there. Oh, that's an XL three preamp, mate. That's the secret. 
go and talk to them. Because people like me, I think most engineers I know are like me, and they'll quite happily talk about sound. Because I love sound, and I love to talk about it. And I'll give my email address to anyone, and I'll always email you back if you've got a sound question. I'm always really quite happy to do that. Because I like talking about it. And my wife is not interested in sound, so I like to have new people to bore about sound. <clears throat> and then to progress uh, business-wise, get connections. Anyone you meet, take their email address. Build up your LinkedIn page. <clears throat> LinkedIn is a really useful thing. Uh, it's really important. Uh, I use LinkedIn so that I can look to see if there's a photo of you because I've got your address, I've got your email address, and you've sent me a good CV, but I've got no recollection of you apart from that. But I remember thinking, yeah, he was all right. But if I see a photo of you on your LinkedIn page or on your CV, I can remember who you are because I've got a good visual memory and a bad memory for almost everything else. So building up a good LinkedIn page, having a sensible email address as well really helps. Um, I was working some... <coughs> A friend of mine, was a, he's just moving into being a keyboard tech, and he was still using the uh, Louis loves you at hotmail.com. It's like not very professional, is it? So having a good building up that thing and making contacts and following them up. So if, you give, you know, if I give you my email address, send me an email in two days' time saying, hi, John, we met at Plaza. I'm the, the one who wants to do, you know, I'm really interested in folk music, uh, if you ever get any bands like that, because I will remember and I'll make a note of it. And then when six months' time or a year's time, someone says, oh, do you know anyone who wants to do a folk tour? I'll go, actually, yes. It doesn't happen very often, but someone said, yes, I really love folk music. I would really love to do a folk tour. And I've done a folk tour, done a couple of folk tours, and it was great fun. I did Cambridge Folk Festival, and it was brilliant fun, because I was right next to the beer tent. <clears throat> and I was there for two. And so you never know what's going to be good fun. And I think that's kind of... It's such a large subject, and I, I hopefully I've, I've covered a few essential, well, a few what I consider sort of pertinent points. Uh, I'd like to throw out some questions because we've got about five minutes left, haven't we? We've got time for yeah, just a couple of questions, really. Um, and has everybody got their name in the hat? Right. Has anyone got a question? Any questions? That's depressing, isn't it? Go on, you've got a question. You didn't mention anything about corporate. Yeah, that's, I, t I did actually, yes, I'm really sorry. Corporate work is, uh, I've never done corporate work because the main reason i never done corporate work is when I left school, I said I was never going to wear a suit and tie. Uh, and, and I managed to keep that up for quite a few years until I got some corporate work. Um, <clears throat> corporate work is it's not something I've got a great deal of experience with, um, but it's one of those things where that very much is, you've got to get a professional persona. And that's the way you'll get corporate work. You've got to be on time, efficient, well-dressed, polite, and act like you're supposed to be there, and interact even more so with... Um, you have to deal with idiots a lot more. I'm really sorry. Uh, there's a reason why we call them idiots, apart from, obviously, Barry and Paddy, but who are officially sort of sound engineers, really. <clears throat> but you have to work as part of a team. Corporate is very much much more so than rock and roll really is part of a team. Uh, and it's, it's schedules and being on time and being very diligent and smart. But this is something you should be in all aspects. You, know, you should be on time. You shouldn't be on time, actually. You should be early. Because if you're early, then no one can turn around to you when it's all gone horribly wrong and loads of shit has happened that wasn't your fault. They can't turn around and say, well, yeah, but you were 10 minutes late. Because you can't argue with that. You were 10 minutes late. So it's actually all your fault now because you were 10 minutes late. The fact that the stage fell over is nothing, which has nothing to do with you, but you were 10 minutes late, and obviously if you're on time, because you should always, that's why I'm insistent about being on time. Sorry, we might need to, we've got to give, get Oren yeah, sorry. in a few moments. So thank you very much, John. That's all right. I'll be around the stand later anyway if anyone's got any questions they want to ask me. Uh, thank you for paying attention, and thank you very much.